Hello, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for Boyce & Associates Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Charts and Chat for August 20th of 2023. Well, I thought I'd start off the chart pack this week with a brief discussion of the weather. And those of you who are in Texas listening to this know exactly what I'm talking about. It's been an extraordinarily hot summer with this heat dome and El Nino that has uh, persisted. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side uh, from the uh, U U.S. Climate Prediction Center uh, data uh, reaffirming what you already know is that uh, in those white dots in the upper left, it shows uh, the cooling degree day. So this is a measure of how much energy it takes to cool a space by one degree. And uh, obviously when it's hotter, uh, it requires more energy to do that. And so you can see here in these dot plots uh, heading into uh, not only uh, June, July, but also the current month of August, that we're tracking well ahead of normal. You can see that in the lower left there too, uh, data as of August 13th, you can see how we're tracking relative to the long-term average. And you know this is pretty compelling stuff. Uh, we are above average uh, on the right-hand side. We've got the global mean July temperatures. So this is really more of where that El Nino comes in. And uh, we're about uh, 1.2 uh, degrees Celsius warmer uh, than this uh, long-term uh, average uh, of the 1951 to 1980 mean global temperature. So even though it's hot here in Texas, it's not just a Texas thing. Uh, this is going on all over uh, the world. And what, what are the ramifications of this? Obviously, we've got, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the risk of uh, arid conditions uh, impairing uh, crop production, which uh, drives food prices higher, uh, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that uh, are kind of salient in, in this data that, that happens as a result of warmer temperatures. Uh, I thought we'd go ahead and pivot uh, into the investment markets for a little bit before we get into the economic data. Usually we do that the other way around, but uh, you know, a very interesting circumstance right now. Here you're looking at the rolling 40-day correlation between the S&P 500 and the Bloomberg Aggregate Fixed Income Index, and so correlations have moved higher again. And what does that mean? It just means that prices for both stocks and bonds are moving a little bit more in uh, tandem. And, you know, of course, uh, you know, the implications of that are that stock prices move up, bond prices are moving at the same rate, which means that yields are moving down. But uh, here lately, uh, we have seen a little bit of a correction uh, of sorts, uh, or I guess maybe correction is not the official term for it, but, you know, we're seeing a down leg in stock prices. And so at the same time that we're seeing yields move higher, and, and you can see that depicted here, that correlations are, are have strengthened. And so stock and bond prices are moving in the same direction, at least for now. Here we have a quick chart on the S&P 500, uh, in the upper level of this chart. And you can see uh, that correction kind of manifested there. We're about, you know, 40 375-ish uh, in that range down from about uh, 4,600, which is that interim high uh, that we saw uh, just a handful of weeks ago. Uh, now, it does look like uh, perhaps this uh, latest down leg might be a little oversold. You can see that oscillation and a little highlight there in the lower part of this chart uh, when it gets down below uh, you know, the 30 level, it means it's probably a little bit oversold. Uh, so not quite there yet, but uh, obviously we have seen a little bit of stress in the markets and it has a lot to do with uh, the fact that we have a lot of bond supply, that we've got real yields uh, that have increased. We'll see that in just a second. Uh, and uh, and that is putting some stress on uh the, uh, the uh, stock markets, and, and in particular, the, uh, the growth stock market sector. Here we've got uh, the uh, NASDAQ composite on the left-hand side uh, and the S&P 600 small cap index. So you can see here that both the technology-laden NASDAQ index as well as small company stocks are, are both feeling this correction, if you will, and are both uh, very close to uh, kind of a, a patently oversold condition. 
Here we have a proportion of companies that are beating earnings estimates on the left-hand side. And interestingly enough, we were able to find this chart that has uh, the same data across other countries, Europe, Japan, emerging markets. Uh, and uh, you know, just really the focus is on uh, perhaps EM, uh, which has had some struggles with earnings. Uh, we know that they kind of hit a, a brief recession, if you will, uh, but uh, the dark blue represents the U.S. So uh, more companies are beating their earnings estimates uh, than uh, certainly we would have expected. However, if you look on the right-hand side, uh, you've got the consensus quarterly, and this is just for the U.S. on the right side here. Uh, you've got the growth forecasts. So if you look at those uh, colored lines there, obviously the first quarter is already in the books, uh, done. Uh, second quarter is, for the most part, done. And you can see how you know, there's a lot of pessimism going into the report. And uh, you know, we're originally, we're looking for about negative 7%. Uh, total S&P earnings heading into the quarterly reporting season. Uh, we ended up a little bit better than that, about negative four, maybe 3.8 or something like that. Uh, but as you look out into the third quarter reporting season, which will start to get in October through the end, middle of end of October for the most part, you can see uh, modestly positive, maybe 1%. Uh, now, and then looking out to the fourth quarter, uh, it's still tracking about 10 to 11 percent. So this is where we might have a disconnect, uh, that there's still a lot of optimism. In fact, you know, with the number of beats that are reflected on the left-hand side, there seems to be more optimism with regard to earnings estimates looking out onto the horizon. And so this seems to not only fly in the face of some of the economic data that we're seeing, and we'll see some of that in just a second, but it uh, also flies in the face of a lot of uh, uh, rhetoric out there that we're going to have some uh, slowdown uh, in the economy uh, around the end of uh, the year and uh, heading into uh, the, maybe the first part of 2024. This chart from uh, Bank of America shows us uh, the degree to which uh, investors are uh, uh, you know, putting their money into tech stocks, uh, kind of chasing these returns, if you will. Uh, and, and these are not just individual investors. These are uh, fund managers. So this is a survey of what these fund managers are doing. And you can see here that tech is uh, the net overweight in tech is uh, spiked up again. Something that I think is really interesting, uh, stock to bond ratio. And this is uh, essentially a you know, S&P 500 divided by the 10-year note and, and, and what that looks like. And you can see this tremendous uptick uh, after the pandemic, you know, with some interruption, but, uh, you know, that they're with, the, with rates, uh, even rates, uh, you know, moving higher, you know, we've had such a strong response in the stock market. This tends to tell me that the stock market is a little bit overvalued relative to bonds at this juncture. Here we have another uh, uh, representation of why I think perhaps uh, on a relative basis stocks are overvalued is essentially taking the forward earnings yield. This would be like earnings of the S&P 500 divided by price. And then you subtract from that the 10-year treasury yield, which we know has moved higher as of late. We're over 4% uh, clearly in the S&P, or excuse me, in the 10-year treasury. So when you do that math, uh, you come up with a number that's actually pretty small right now. So with 10-year uh, treasury moving higher, uh, earnings yield with prices still relatively high on stocks is not that much. And so the net of all that is a pretty small number. And you can see here going back to really the exiting of the, uh, the great uh, technology bubble bursting at the beginning of the century, you know, you, you, that's the last time that we've seen this uh, particular data series run this low. And again, I think it just tells me that stocks relative to bonds are overvalued. A couple more uh, detail points as we go into uh, uh, maybe a little bit more fixed income conversation. Uh, we've been talking about this for a number of months now with short term rates moving higher. Uh, there is a strong desire on the part of investors, both uh, the fund managers as well as individual investors, to move money into 
money market mutual funds and uh, because they're yielding fairly strong right now. Short, ultra short uh, funds are, are in the 5.3% range. Uh, and you can see as a result, uh, a lot of assets are moving into them. And uh, you can see cash inflows into global money market funds uh, looking really, really strong this year. Uh, again, not just the U.S., but all across the globe. Here we have the U.S. Uh, aggregate bond index monthly return. If it's something that uh, is worth mentioning this year, it's, it's the volatility of bond returns. Now, we know that bond returns were terrible last year, uh, really on a, on a historic level. Uh, but we started off the year fairly well, uh, and, but, but we've meandered since then. You can see the 10-year Treasury in that black line. Uh, as we know that it's been moving higher, and that's on the right-hand side scale there. Uh, but uh, as a result, bond returns have been fairly muted because we've had this latest uptick in yields, and that's uh, really put a lid on returns. And so when you look at bond returns year to date, uh, when we thought that, uh, uh, you know, that, that both stocks and bonds would have positive returns for the year, uh, it's uh, relatively muted on the bond side right now. Something that we've been monitoring here is uh, certainly credit. So we know from the senior loan officer surveys uh, at banks uh, that credit standards are clearly getting tighter. And so what's happening is that people are going outside the traditional banking sector to get credit. And you can see private credit loans uh, have spiked as a result. Uh, this chart from Bloomberg uh, actually, uh, the source of this data is KBRA, uh, and uh, but uh, but obviously you've seen a real spike, and so you know we obviously want to monitor this. But credit spreads, as we'll see in a second, are still really tight, which implies that the market doesn't really uh, f believe that there's a lot of risk out there, which I think is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, but the market clearly doesn't isn't pricing in a lot of risk yet uh, for these types of loans, but they can be pretty volatile. Here we have the high yield uh, index. Uh, this is a high yield actually relative to treasuries on the top scale. And you can see how high yield is done uh, and uh, obviously been very strong this year. And if you look at the lower half of this chart, that shows you the option adjusted spread or OAS. And that's just a, a, essentially a spread over treasuries. And, um, and, you know, spreads have become pretty tight, you know, as treasuries yields have moved higher, so have uh, high yield, but, you know, perhaps not as much, but they've been performing really strongly. And these, these spreads are really not consistent uh, with what you'd expect, you know, if you're heading into a slowdown. I thought I'd show the Fed Funds uh, futures curve. So we did have the release of the Federal Reserve minutes from their latest uh, open market committee meeting. And uh, as we've talked about some slowing, uh, you know, it's probably one of the biggest conundrums in the market right now is what should the Fed do given all of the data? And we've got leading economic indicators, which are down for 15th straight month. Uh, then we've got some manufacturing data that's actually a little bit stronger than expected. Uh, and, and it's not uniform in, in its direction. And so there's a lot of speculation over what the Fed's going to do. But there, the minutes from the latest meeting were actually, on a net basis, a little hawkish, meaning that there was still the sentiment out there that inflation's too high. There still needs to be care and concern for making sure that the economy doesn't overheat and inflation, you know, uh, you know, burns too hot. And so, you know, that has resulted in a, you know, this uh, Fed funds futures curve, which uh, is higher than it was even just a, a week ago. Now, now, looking out on the horizon, obviously, there's a pretty strong expectation that short term rates are going to come down. In fact, ending next year, December 2024, at or around 4.4 percent from about you know, 5.3% now. Uh, but uh, obviously, we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. But clearly, there's not a consensus on the Fed as to what they should even do with interest rates. 
But I'd say that by and large, the you know, I, I think the sentiment of us being really, really, really close to the end of the tightening cycle is probably pretty valid. Here we have treasury yields, uh, two and 10 year. Uh, yield curve is still inverted. Uh, you can see that because the 10 year yield is in green here and it's below the two year. Uh, both have moved higher. Uh, again, for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of supply in the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't have nearly as, uh, you know, the supply and demand equations a little bit, you know, out of balance right now. So with that extra supply, you know, prices are lower and as a result, you know, yields are higher. And so that's not necessarily the only thing going on, but that has some thing to do with it. And we've seen this shift really ever since we got the credit downgrade by Fitch on U.S. sovereign debt. A couple of other things that are worth noting here on interest rates. We've got the real Fed funds target rate, which is essentially the nominal rate, the Fed funds that we've been talking about, uh, essentially, you know, five to five and a half in that range over the last handful of months. Um, and then you subtract out an inflation rate, which is in decline. And so as a result, you're getting positive growth in real Fed funds. And uh, usually what the, happens there is that starts to put pressure on growth stocks and uh, puts uh, pressure on the equity market in general. So I would add this to the list of things that are causing a little pressure on the equity market right now uh, is the rise in real yields, which is clearly depicted in the upper half of this chart in the blue line now uh and then uh you've got the uh, three three month the 10 year treasury curve uh spread uh and that is uh, actually moved a bit lower uh so but you know interestingly enough as you look at this data and this is from uh, alpine macro is that and you, and you see those little overlaid gray bars and those represent recession periods and so um, you know, what this correlates to when you have these spikes in the real Fed funds target rate is that's what you usually see before you have a recession, not that we're necessarily going to. And the odds of that, as, as predicted by a lot of these investment banks, has certainly gone down. Uh, but, you know, you can see the relationship. And similarly, on the three to 10 year, three month to 10 year spread, you know, when that falls, um, and uh, it goes negative, uh, that is another strong indicator uh, of uh, or foreshadow perhaps of uh, some type of an inflationary environment. And so the takeaway on this is that, you know, if you even if you believe that we're not going into recession, the prima facie evidence here of the prospect of future slowdown is, is pretty strong. Here we have the 10 year uh, tips yield, which is the treasury inflation protected security. So this would be the difference. Uh, th th this is essentially a, a proxy for what the market feels like the 10 year uh, inflation rate is gonna look like. And you can see here that's moved higher. Uh, it's about 2%. Uh, this, you typically do see something like this. Uh, it, uh, well, I, let me just say, first of all, that when you see uh, Ten-year tips uh, move higher. It's typically not good for stocks, so uh, that's something else to consider. Uh, and then uh, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Really, the, the the tips moving higher, and I think you know you, you could argue that the that the tips are probably pretty attractive right now, even though we do have inflation moving down. But that uh, that spread is almost too good to pass up, perhaps. We'll transition into housing. So we've got the Freddie Mac 30-year mortgage rate, which is uh, 7.2%. You can see the meteoric rise there. And uh, we've even have, you know, kind of round-tripped it, if you will, over the last uh, probably seven to eight months. Uh, and, you know, uh, again, you know, over time, you know, people tend to forget uh, that we had these ultra low rates, uh, you know, for somebody who, you know, refinanced at two and a half percent, I feel extremely lucky looking in hindsight. And there are a lot of people like me that are 
you know, that have low rates that are not in the least bit inclined to want to move so they can go avail themselves to a 7.2% mortgage rate. However, the longer we go, the more people are going to have, uh, you know, this recency bias. They're going to say, well, you know, if rates go down to six, well, that's a lot better than seven. And they're going to not think about necessarily three to 4% rates as much because on a relative basis, moving down, you know, uh, from seven to six is about a 14, 15% move. And that's going to be more impactful to people over time. Here's housing affordability. Uh, we're at the lowest level uh, in, in this particular data series um, because of mortgage rates and the fact that not only do we have, for the reasons I mentioned in the last slide, that people with low mortgages uh, are not inclined to move, so supply is low, uh, but demand is high uh, for housing, even with, uh, even with rates. And so we've seen the supply and the demand curves sh both shift down uh, in, uh, in the housing market, uh, but housing affordability is uh, clearly uh, continues to be challenged. Single family starts and permits. Uh, you know, obviously, there is more of a scramble on the part of builders to get more product out there. Uh, so you see these numbers kind of like picking up a little bit uh, here in 2023. We'll talk about retail sales now. Uh, we got uh, the most recent data here. Uh, you can see the change from February 2020 on the left-hand side on a nominal basis. We're up over 30%. You know, we've talked about the resiliency of the consumer and how retail sales have really been a bellwether. In fact, it you know it largely is responsible for a lot of the economic growth that we've experienced. Now, there are reasons why I don't necessarily think that that is going to continue at the rate that we've seen it. Uh, but for now, let's just look at the nominal rate. You can see that moving higher. If you adjust for inflation, uh, it is still up over the last four months. You can see that in the gray line there. And then the components of this are over on the right. You can see uh, online sales really strong. You know, there is some back to school uh, here uh, at play. You've got uh, books and hobbies and stuff like that. Clothing, department stores, you know, have all benefited. Grocery continues to be pretty strong, even though we've had some moderation in food prices, but food away from home uh, as well as food at home is, is still, you know, uh, re relatively strong. Where we have seen some erosion here is uh, some of the more capital uh, goods items or electronics and furniture. So when we look at tighter credit spreads, I mentioned this before, um, and that's clearly happening. And actually, you can see uh, in this uh, kind of aqua line, this little blue aqua line, you know, uh, the credit standards have gotten really tight. Uh, and you can see that there in that, in that aqua line. And you can see the, the relationship between that and retail sales. So when credit gets tight, retail sales tend to get impacted. And so this is why I think that the resiliency of retail sales post pandemic is apt to flag a, a little bit. And so being the driver of, you know, one of the main drivers of total consumption, uh, which uh, consumption accounts for two thirds to 70% of the economy. So if you have a slowdown in retail sales, uh, you know, that that's going to cause a little bit of um, uh, stress, you know, create kind of a speed bump on the economy. And so, you know, I think these are just things that as we kind of head into the latter part of the year that we need to be cognizant of. And, uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit that, you know, these were things that I thought would manifest a lot earlier this year, but retail sales have been, uh, you know, uniquely strong, I think, because we still have excess savings uh, out there. Uh, we exited the kind of the pandemic and the stimulus period with about $2 trillion of excess savings uh, on the part of consumers. And we've eroded about 1.8 to 1.9 of that down. And so at some point, this, uh, this seed corn uh, kind of gets exhausted. And, and I just think, you know, we're looking at a period, maybe some months from now, where retail sales are not going to be very uh, attractive. 
Here we have some delinquencies moving higher on the part of auto loans and credit cards. Uh, really uh, seeing mortgages kind of like, you know, perk up just a little bit. Uh, wouldn't get too, you know, crazy about all this yet, but it just goes to show you that, uh, you know, with people wanting to maintain their spending habits, uh, they're reaching into the savings, which we just talked about. They're putting money on their credit cards, which we just talked about. And, you know, now we've got people that are, you know, the people that are in the position of having to move because of a job or whatever, are taking on these higher mortgages and, you know, it's causing, in some cases, a little bit of stress. Here we have gasoline prices uh, moving back higher. This has a lot to do with supply. Uh, also, uh, we have seen oil prices in general move a little bit higher because of some of the actions of OPEC plus in terms of managing supply, particularly the Saudis. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, during the summer where you have peak driving, uh, you know, this is obviously an issue last year uh, and we got relief heading into the in, heading into the end of the year and the new year, but uh, those prices have moved up consistently uh, as, as we transitioned into those summer blends in the peak driving season. Well, with all the data that we've seen, uh, you know, there's still this uh, consensus out there that uh, GDP or, or economic growth uh, for the third quarter uh, will be somewhere around one and a half percent, you know, and we'll get this the first reading of this, uh, again, the third quarter, which ends September. So we'll get the first reading during the fourth uh, week of October, uh, last week of October, generally. Now, I put this in here to show you what the Atlanta Fed and their GDP Now estimate has come up with. Now, with retail sales being much stronger than expected, they're actually predicting something closer to 5% which uh, is uh, you know, obviously hugely divergent from what the consensus feels. But I will have to say that Atlanta Fed, this GDP now estimate has been extraordinarily close uh, in predicting actual economic growth. And uh, if they are right, this is going to be a pretty tremendous print uh, and it's gonna add, you know, pour gasoline on top of the fire of this, you know, this enthusiasm and this stronger investor sentiment. And honestly, it could lead to uh, some positive earnings growth, um, uh, excuse me, some positive stock stock price growth rather. Uh, and, and it will certainly reinforce some of these earnings estimates that are out there. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll obviously have to watch that and be poised for a potential for an economic data surprise coming out of GDP. Here's something I, I want to make sure that we're focusing on a little bit, and that's the regional bank sector. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, regional bank issues and news uh, out there earlier this spring. Uh, and then you haven't really heard that much about it, but it, but it still is out there. And so this is the, uh, the green part is a special program that was set up uh, by the uh, uh, Federal Reserve and Treasury uh, in the wake of Silicon Valley's failure. Uh, in March. And so you can see that it's called the, the Bank Term Funding Program or BTFP. And, you know, banks use that for uh, a while, you know, to kind of stabilize themselves. There's a lot of confidence issues on the part of regional banks. And so that kind of simmered, kind of went away, kind of May-ish. Uh, but then oddly enough, we've seen kind of this consistent pickup in the use of this facility which tells me perhaps that uh, that there is some latent stress in the in the regional banking sector. So expect perhaps uh, more consolidations, mergers, uh, and uh, hopefully not too much of this, but maybe even some comments with regard to uh, certain uh, entities out there, so certain regional banks that uh, you know find themselves in a, in perhaps a little bit of a little bit of a pickle. Uh, you know, what's interesting about regional banks is the Silicon Valley uh, bank issue was not a credit problem. It was a balance sheet problem. It was managing your assets and liabilities. And, uh, you know, as we just saw on a few slides, we've got maybe the risk of some credit stress down the road. And if that happens, 
then regional banks are not only going to be dealing with the fact that a lot of their you know, assets are valued a lot uh, 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 less because of the uh, higher interest rates, but also they may be dealing with a little bit of credit related delinquencies as well. Here we have uh, some data from S&P Global, and uh, it just shows you that, uh, you know, as we've gone through the last several quarters that we have now, uh, we're now witnessing more uh, credit downgrades than upgrades. And so credit rating agencies, just as the U.S. sovereign rating got lowered by Fitch not too long ago, uh, we're seeing a, uh, perhaps a lot more of the downgrades coming in aggregate and certainly more than we're seeing uh, credit raises. Here we have um, uh, consumer expectations for inflation. Uh, Left-hand side, we've got one and three year kind of hovering in that three to three and a half range. Uh, and that's, um, uh, and then we transition over to the right-hand side and then we've got five to 10 years. And so that's looking about 2.8 Eight right now. So inflation expectations looking out on the horizon remain fairly anchored. Here we have uh, crude oil futures. We saw gasoline uh, earlier spike higher. Uh, same thing going on with crude futures. Again, same story there. We've got Saudis that are curtailing production and OPEC plus. Those dynamics are at play here uh, in the summer months driving oil prices higher. Here we have a chart, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, the small businesses have done much of the uh, hiring uh, since the beginning of the year. You can see that in the left-hand side, that big bar, zero to 49 employees, pretty high. Uh, and so, uh, but on the right-hand side, you see from the uh, uh, NFIB, uh, the National Federation of Independent Business, which is kind of the, the spokesperson or proxy, if you will, for the small business community. So they, they have a survey and, it, and you know this on the right, it shows the net percentage of firms reporting higher sales. And so that's rolling over. So, so firms uh, on average are reporting lower sales at the same time they've been doing all the hiring lately. So what does this say about the future for employment in the labor market? And job growth and those types of things. So it's something that is worth paying attention to. Conference board uh, leading uh, or index of leading economic indicators down for a 15th straight month. You can see the components on the right. Uh, interest rates uh, remain, uh, uh, the spreads remain negative uh, and consumer expectations are weaker. Uh, Institute for Supply Management new orders are weaker, uh, as well as the work weeks are coming in, and that's obviously offset by stock prices. And the job market remains <clears throat> relatively strong still, but overall uh, continues the downtrend in LEI. So, and then I put the LEI back on the plate here. Uh, that's the, in that uh, aqua blue line. And then I overlay that with the S&P. You know, this is from the Daily Shot. And it's a Bloomberg data series here. You know, th there's a lot of noise in this uh, data series. And I think there's a, a rough correlation. But, you know, what what's really um, apparent here is that stocks are kind of blind to a lot of these you know, relatively important data series. I mean, the LEI has kind of always been generally a bedrock. You know, when you saw the LEI down for 15 straight months, you're like, well, we've got to have, you know, at least an economic slowdown, if not a recession around the corner. But you certainly wouldn't know it from looking at the stock market right now. Here we have the Philly Fed, uh, again, on the from the standpoint of puts and takes, you know, you've got some data that's a little weaker, some indices that are a little weaker like the LEI, but then over here, we've got the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index and new orders, both spiking higher, uh, which, uh, and I put on the right-hand side, capital spending plans, which is really interesting because, you know, we've got the spike in manufacturing because manufacturing has been really, really, really weak lately. 
but yet the latest spike has not translated into increased confidence in future prospects enough to warrant you know increased capital spending on the part of companies so companies are being pretty cautious in this environment here we have manufacturing production month over month uh, kind of following along the philly fed uh, a little bit of an uptick here uh, but where is that coming from and so when you the devil's always in the details and if you kind of dig into it a little bit more you realize that it, it's coming from motor vehicles uh, and you know, then you can see that in the upper right hand side. The lower right hand side shows you in that amber line what that real manufacturing number looks like if you back out vehicles and parts. And, and if you do that, then you actually see that manufacturing is still pretty sluggish. So I want to pivot a little bit to China. Uh, you know, there, there are some issues that we do need to be aware of in China. Um, you know, they have really, you know, you think about kind of the three Ds, if you will. They've got, you know, uh, debt, uh, deflation, and demographics all working against them right now. And uh, the data coming out of China is pretty weak. In fact, so much so that at least on youth unemployment, uh, China just said, we're not going to give you that data anymore. Uh, so they're trying to protect <clears throat> or hide the fact that there is uh, some notable weakness in China. And so I think deflation uh, is is a real uh, concern. China, there's a lot of, you know, construction that doesn't have any return on it. You know, empty apartment buildings and, and uh, airports that are hardly even used. And so when you look at this data, you've got loans, you've got credit problems. China, try, you know lowered their interest rates, which is kind of a reflexively defensive move. If you are feel like you're in trouble, then you're going to drop your rates to try to stimulate activity. And that's what they're doing. But yet you can see retail sales after that little post, you know, like coming out of that pandemic shutdown bubble, uh, you know, it is really kind of softened up here. Here's a quick chart on what I was talking about on the last slide, uh, China uh, Central Bank, the PBOC, People's Bank of China, uh, cratering interest rates to try to save their economy, if you will. Uh, and as a result uh, of that, you can see the dollar has gotten really strong. And that's on the right hand side. And this is a, an inverted uh, um, uh, chart here. So you can see how, how much, if you had a dollar, how much yuan would that buy? And you can see that that's moving lower, but you can see that those numbers on that scale are inverted. So it's actually uh, showing a tremendous amount of weakness on the part of the yuan. This week with a couple of interesting charts uh, here, um, you know, not exactly sure what, uh, you know, totally we, we make of this, but uh, global smartphone shipments have been in a little bit of a decline. Uh, you know, we've got strong global adoption of smartphones, but unit volume has been trending down a little bit and we're looking actually pretty weak this year uh, at least according to the estimates from counterpoint research so when you think about replacement cycles we think about apple we think about people that are in the smartphone business and even the component business and the assembly business you know the the trade issues with china and the fact that apple you know assembles most of its iphones there uh, you know, what are the implications of, of all of this? Uh, and I think, you know, it's interesting to look at and not, not a data point that I would have expected, um, considering that there still are parts of the world that do not have a lot of penetration of smartphones yet. And, uh, to end this week, there is, uh, Definitely a, a rise in the number of job listings that are related to generative AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, not too surprisingly, we've seen a bunch of these over the last several months. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, I, I think, is just indicative of a trend. The people are scrambling to bring in talent to try to help them understand, you know, the opportunity set for AI and how they can implement it in their business, as well as, you know, how they can drive, you know, better sales and in customer experiences out of uh, using AI. That's all we've got this week. I hope you have a great week and we'll talk to you again soon.